Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson. It's great to see you today. It is. It's feeling a whole lot like Christmas. It is. You know, Canada mm. is a very large country with people of many different cultural backgrounds. Because of this, there are lots of different Christmas traditions celebrated each year. And we want to share some of them with you. Now, First of all, Laura Lynn is going to wear these lights. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, huh? You know, and okay, they actually blink a little bit, too. Well, there you go. Look I'm, at that. I'm willing to take it now, for the team. Drum roll, please. First of all, Labrador City in Newfoundland holds a Christmas light and contest. Each year, people decorate the outside of their houses up with lights and often have a big ice sculpture. Did you know mm, that? I did not know that. So, number two, tell well, us. Well, there is like Sink that. Tuck. Yeah, it's a festival started by the Inuit, and you know I lived in Tuk Tuk, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm, for many mm -hmm. years, three years. You this celebration well. consists of dancing and gift exchanging. Well, I guess if we can kind of sync <clears throat> Tuk with Labrador I with feel the lights. I, do and everything. I look okay? No, and in number this? three, <laughs> many families of French descent have a huge party on Christmas Eve called the Réveillon. Wow, yeah. I like the way you say that. Yeah. And the Santa Claus Parade in Toronto is one of the oldest and largest Santa parades in the world. I it loved is. the Santa Parade when I was young I in I Vancouver. I oh. But speaking of Santa Claus, what do you know about him? Hmm. You may be surprised to learn that he's not just a, a gift-bringing jolly old man. He also represents giving, forgiveness, and Christian faith. What's this interesting story? Yeah, I like that. Ace, I think a lot of people blame the commercialization of Christmas on Santa Claus, but don't you think he gets kind of a bad rap? He does, really, the commercialization of Christmas, that long season that we look at as Christmas started in World War II, when we asked men and women to shop early so that we could get presents to troops on the field in time for Christmas. Hmm. That's what opened up the window to having a five or six week holiday, and it's one of the greatest gifts we as Christians have ever gotten. Yeah, it seems like, you know, there's no other season of the year where you can talk about Jesus and God for this, this amount of time. And it opens up the door. If we know the stories behind the traditions, if we know the stories behind the songs, when those play or we see them, we can share that with others. And it becomes an opportunity for us to share our faith like we're not welcome to do any other time of the year. And rarely do people turn their backs on that. They listen to it because it's a part of the culture and the tradition of this season. And in a lot of ways, Santa is really a Christ-like figure. I mean, he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. And he also is one of those beloved creatures who reaches out and hugs children. He doesn't really represent anything but pure, wonderful giving and love. If you did a DNA test on Santa, it would come up with two important Christian men, Nicholas of Barra, the man who we base Santa Claus on, the one who reached out to the least of these all around the globe. And the other is a 10th century Duke of Bohemia. We remember him as King Wenceslas, mm -hmm. who went to his, his citizens on Christmas Eve every year, handing the least of these, the poorest of the poor, food, clothing, and firewood. And he did that even in the midst of winter to teach his subjects what the true meaning of Christmas really was. Wow, so Santa's really a symbol of giving to the needy and forgiving. And also, because of his roots, a symbol of Christian faith. Well, Laura Lynn, that was very fascinating. Most yes. of the time, we don't get that in-depth understanding of, right. of Santa Claus and St. Nick and right. St. Nicholas. Right, and how it all came to be and yes. what it really signifies. Yes. You, you know, the one thing that I, I really appreciated as well, because I've been one of those, I, I could be in, in uh, Scrooge at times, right? <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> you know, only, only with the, uh, you know, because there's not enough cheese when I start whining, but, uh, <laughs> so I stopped whining. But oh, what? Funny. What you see with yeah. a lot of the uh, advertisements about mm -hmm. Christmas, it seems like it's getting earlier and earlier, but right. understanding the troops and right. getting the presents to them yes. in time for Christmas makes a lot more sense. It does make sense. Our testimony. I mean, I think they're taking advantage of it maybe now, Probably. but it yeah. all started with a really good reason to have yeah. uh, lots of time, you know, to bless other people. But it is a season of generosity. Um, I've been staggered at some of the stories that I've heard from adults in my travels and working with some of those in uh, um, you know, who are struggling with addiction and all of that, but they didn't have great Christmases. Yeah. A lot of families really struggle to have 
uh, presence under the tree. Yeah. And uh, in growing up, um, my parents uh, were missionaries and my mom and dad, they never made a lot of money at all. But we always, you know, However it was, the Lord provided so that Christmas was so special. And uh, I'm thinking about how many there are around us who just, they don't have the ability to bless their children. And maybe we all, you know, can think about that family that well, we know could uh, be blessed. I think you're right about that. And you know, when you start looking at uh, lights and you start thinking about it this time of year, mm -hmm. one of the traditions that we held uh, and, and we continued at, at our house was always inviting people in right. and sharing what we had. Nice. And it was, uh, it, it just seemed like there was this community <laughs> right. uh, where everyone went to everyone's house and ate, right. you know, and pie, and, and with my friends, mm -hmm. they would come over to my house, and we'd go over to their house, and then everybody just seems like you just continued right. to uh, to celebrate. But mm -hmm. I, I, I learned a, a sense of, of appreciation, but also community and family out of that. Well, it's so wonderful to to be able to bless out of the bounty that God yeah. has given us to just think of that one family or yeah. someone special that God's bringing to your mind right now that you could even just call and say to the mom, you yeah. know, is there something special that your son would like for Christmas? Yeah, and, and even and, if you don't give him anything, but just let him know that you're thinking of him and mm -hmm. open up your home as mm -hmm. well as your heart, that nice. there's room in the end. Mm -hmm. Well, up next, Emma McKinley spent years confined to a wheelchair until one very special Christmas Eve when she was healed. Watch. Easter weekend, 1993, Emma McKinley lost her balance and fell from a storage loft at work. Her foot was lodged between boxes and her body hung upside down until a coworker found her and called 911. My head hit something very hard. And I did not come to until the next day. As Emma healed from the wound she received in the fall, she developed widespread reflex sympathetic dystrophy, known as RSD, a chronic and progressive nerve disorder that left her entire body in severe pain. I partnered up with God because this accident was bigger than I could handle, and I knew that I needed to know Jesus more in my life now than ever before. Eventually, Emma was bound to a wheelchair. Kathy Rutterberg has been her caregiver for the last 18 years. She could not walk at all. She was in her wheelchair 24 seven with the exception of toileting and she's been like that for many, many years. Eventually that pain got so bad in that foot and in the left hand that the foot started to grow crooked. Emma's left hand closed into a fist she was unable to open. Her neck and spine twisted to the left, leaving her body in an awkward and painful position. Her son Jason saw how hard life had become for his mother. It was difficult to see her just doing daily things. You can see the pain in her face, you know, and it's hard to see somebody go through that, you know, much less a, a family member. Through the years, Emma maintained a positive attitude despite her painful situation. No matter how rough her life was physically, she's always had just a bright smile on her face and always been so warm and so encouraging. And the other thing that I've never seen waver is her faith. I kept pressing forward each and every day, knowing that Jesus was going to give me that strength, that he was going to be there for me. And he never let me down. He was there for me. Blood clots formed in her legs, which posed life-threatening issues. Doctors wanted to amputate both of her legs, but Emma refused. I never gave up. I kept praying and thanking God for my healing because I had that much faith in my Jesus to know that someday he was going to give me that healing. The night before Christmas Eve 2011, Emma fell out of her wheelchair. For eight hours, she lay on the floor in excruciating pain, crying out to Jesus for help. Emma says that Jesus came into her room and reached out to touch her. And what I saw was the most awesome white robe. I knew who that was. 
our human eyes, we can't even hardly look at it. It's so bright white. I couldn't see it, but I could feel that left foot going from this position to this position. Jesus was straightening out that crooked foot. I knew my neck was being straightened, my spine was being straightened. That left hand that had been clenched fist for over 18 years. Jesus started to take those fingers and open them up. And I could take that hand and I could flex it and use my fingers. Jesus was now kneeling on one knee right beside me. And he extended his hand out to me, asking for mine. And then we stood up together. And even though the bones were sounding and cracking like crazy, he still had a hold of my hands. Then I knew I had to start walking and use his feet and legs, and I did. Just a few hours later, Emma's two sons and her grandchildren came over to celebrate Christmas Eve, unaware of the miracle their mother just experienced. And I could see down the hallway a little bit, and here she comes walking. And it's like, no way. I hadn't seen mom out of a wheelchair, I think since my wedding in 1993. At that moment, everything I knew was different because, you know, she's supposed to be in the chair, but she's walking. And it was just a surreal moment seeing her walk. It's like, it's a miracle. There's, there's nothing else it could be. We kind of got through hugging my two sons. I went over and grabbed those two grandsons, and I gave them a big hug for the first time in all those years. That night, Emma and her family were in awe of God's love and power as they celebrated her Christmas miracle. Emma says that being able to stand and walk on her own has changed her life forever. Although she still has RSD symptoms, she and her family believe that God is in control. Today with her son, Jason, Emma joyfully shares her story of how Jesus heard her prayers and forever changed her life on Christmas Eve. You know, this is such a story of hope. This, this miracle is not just for my mom, not just for our family, but it's for everybody. Whatever difficulties people may be facing, there's always hope. Jesus has never let me down. He's always been there for me. In his word, he says that he will never leave us or forsake us. And I knew that, and I trust his word. I'm no longer the crooked lady with a broken body in the wheelchair. I'm known as the lady with a Christmas miracle. What a powerful testimony. You know, when I hear Emma, you can just hear faith just exuding out of every comment that she has made. She just believed Jesus. She believed Jesus. You know, that's what the Bible says in, in Mark 5 and 36. It says, and do not be afraid, only believe. I believe that God is going to do a work of, of grace and mercy in your life today as well. And I want to pray for you. I want to give you also a scripture that's been just burning in my spirit uh, as we're approaching Christmas and during this time. You know, we always remember the shepherds in the field and hearing about the angels, the multitude of angels. Do you realize that when Christ was born, there was a restoration of the angelic host and there were more at his birth and also at the resurrection than even in the beginning. So believe that God has stationed angels around you, according to Psalms 91, to keep you in all your ways. But as the children of Israel were moving into the promised land, it says in Exodus chapter 23, 25, so you shall serve the Lord your God. And it says, and he will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. My God, believe that God wants to heal you today. Do you believe that? If you believe that, I want to pray with you right now. And I, I believe God is going to do a miracle, but I want you to call the number on the screen. Touch that area. 
Father, I know someone has been battling with a neck issue, and I felt like even listening to Emma, Lord, while they've been listening to this and moving their neck around, Lord, you've been, you've been now realigning, Lord, those vertebrae. And I plead your blood, and I thank you in advance for your miraculous healing. I pray that you would grant them also strength in their skeletal frame, in their, Lord, in, in, in their, their lymphatic system. I don't know what's been plagued in that area, but I pray that there would be even now a release in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you that you're so good and your mercy endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, call the number on the screen. After the break, Laura Lynn has a powerful teaching for us on prayer. I want to talk today about the power of prayer. I came across this verse yesterday and I was completely stunned by it. Here it is. It says this in Hebrews 5 verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. I couldn't help but wonder, why did Jesus have to pray? The Bible says he could have called the angels to rescue him from the violence of the cross, and yet he put aside his position and he humbled himself and he became obedient to the Father's will so that all of mankind, you and I, would be redeemed from our wrongs. I think of the prayers that I've prayed in tears before God because of my own humanity and my sin. But Jesus, he never did anything wrong. What he did was gave us an example of how we are to approach our Heavenly Father. I wrote this prayer for us today. Will you right now in reverent submission, just as Jesus did, pray this with me? Thank you for healing my heart, God. Thank you for breaking me so intensely that I found out who you really are so that I would know who I really am. Thank you that no demonic accusation has stood nor will stand against me as you have barred every assault by residing as a shield in my defense. Thank you that you have used even my enemies to advance my call and my destiny. I praise you for seeing me in my brokenness and not despising me, God, but rather loving me unendingly, restoring me compassionately, redeeming me supernaturally by the profundity of the cross and revealing to me your devotion, your dedication. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your loyalty, for your commitment and your consecration to what you began in my mother's womb. You see, formed in darkness, you knew, God, that I would be a mess one day and I would need that price of your precious and only son. It would need to be paid on my behalf. Father, seeing my sin nature, even before time began, you had already crafted a plan to protect me from myself and lead me to my purpose. I submit my will. I surrender my pride. I relinquish my rights to you. I concede all personal gains and yields. I yield all control to Jesus. I am yours alone, created to bow, to serve, and to worship the King of Kings. I love you, God, and my life is not my own. I surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. I married the wrong man. Am I stuck forever in this hopeless nightmare? What am I going to do? Thanks for your hard work. I've got to stop drinking. But how do I stop? How can I break this addiction? I'm so depressed. Nothing seems good anymore. Can I ever crawl out of this black hole? So I cheated and we won. There are a lot of sins worse than that, right? I mean, it's not like I killed somebody. Our minds are filled with hard questions, situations and challenges that come at us every day. Where do we go for answers? And who can we ask? 
In Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Ask Anything, you'll get biblical answers to life's toughest questions. You'll discover important insights in finance, health, spirituality, and relationships. Get Ask Anything and get the answers you need today. Welcome back. We're excited to offer you our latest premium called Ask Anything. This DVD presents godly counsel on topics like how to be forgiven, suicide, developing spiritual disciplines, and how to achieve success. Yeah. And all you need to do is become a 700 Club Canada partner. Hmm. It's our gift to you for joining. If you've got questions and you don't know where or how to find the answers, get Ask Anything. You'll find the wisdom and counsel you need to meet the challenges that you face. Mm. If you call, we'll send it to you immediately. 1-855-759-0700. And in our, our time of prayer requests, we want to thank you for not only liking us on social media, but also sending in your praise reports. Mm. But today we want to pray for a specific need that we've received a lot of. Mm. And that is for uh, financial needs. And Jacques, Gloria... Marlene and Donna and David. And David, would you put them on your prayer request? Yes. And if you're a part of that as well, I believe as First John says, that you would prosper even mm. as your soul prospers. Mm. The Lord is going to prosper you. Mm. Let's agree. Father, we bring specifically these uh, people that have requested help in this time of need, oh God. We pray, Father, that you would be their portion, their source, yes. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We pray also for families that are uh, watching right now and are experiencing a little bit of financial pressure right now. Father, would you ease their tension? Would you ease the anxiety in their heart? We know who you are, God. Yes. We know you are able. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And Father, we take authority over unrighteous mammon. And those areas, Lord, we ask that where we've been neglectful, we pray that even now you would bring an awareness, not only because of the lack of finances, but also for the strain. But we ask that you would lift that. And I pray that you would break the curse of Adam that your children right now as they're receiving this would begin to move into the blessing of Abraham Amen. whom you blessed in all things. Yeah. Lord, you said that, uh, that our souls would prosper as well. Mm -hmm. And I pray that they would not be held or hamstrung where they cannot serve you. So with the, the dedication today, principling it in their heart, I pray for release now in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen. My Amen. God, I felt that. If that's yes. you, call that number. Good. We want to leave you with a power verse as well. Mm -hmm. And hold on to this. The word makes you spiritual. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you <clears throat> mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. And to end our show today, we have a special Christmas song by, by musician Terry Posthumus. This is the promised one. Mm -hmm. The darkness is defeated by pure and holy light. The gloom is overcome by grace that shines so bright. A child has been born to us. God gave us a son. He is a promised one. Comfort for my people. Take courage and rejoice. Your bonds are broken and the price is paid in full. Clear a path in the desert. Emmanuel has come. He is a promised one. The promised one, our Prince of Peace. A wonder to behold. That you would come to redeem this world. The prophets once the counselor wonderful good 
Good news, shout Messiah as loud as you can. A shepherd king is coming and his kingdom is at hand. Go tell it on a mountain, here is your God. He is the promised one. The promised one, our prince of peace. A wonder to behold that you would come to redeem this world. The prophets once foretold. The counselor wonderful. of peace, a wonder to behold, that you would come to redeem this world, the prophets once foretold, the counselor wonderful. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. On tomorrow's show... Two undercover narcotics agents were waiting for me inside a pharmacy. I resisted arrest and we tore up the entire store. So I was charged with 18 felonies, three misdemeanors, and um, was facing up a maximum of 45 years. Life for David Valsic had always been good until he was about nine years old. My parents sat me down and they said, um, mommy and dad are getting a divorce. You have to decide. 